Hello and welcome to Bethel Church Online. We hope you enjoyed the extra hour of sleep. I'm Pastor Frank. And I'm Laura Silveri. Thank you for choosing to tune in today. Hey, we wanted to give you a heads up about our town hall webinar that's happening November 8th, next Sunday. Town Hall at Bethel is a time to hear from our pastors on the good that God has helped us to accomplish. You'll want to tune in at 5 p.m. And we hope that you'll register at Bethel.org slash town hall. It's important to register, Bethel.org slash town hall. Again, it's great to have you here. Now join with us in worship.
things of the world If the light breaks the chains Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb Every knee will bow
Hey, thank you for worshiping with us today. If this is your first time at Bethel Church, let us know by sending an email at hello at Bethel.org. Uh, we've even got a Starbucks gift card just for you, so let us know. Join us in the Zoom lobby after service by clicking the link in the chat. We look forward to connecting with you. Now we'd like to share a couple of reminders for you. Yeah, actually we've got a boatload of reminders. Today is the first week of our series, Reach. It's a five-week series designed to encourage and empower everyday Christ followers to be missionaries every day. Also today, our young adult ministry is meeting at Salt and Straw at 6 p.m. Go to Bethel.org slash events to find out more. Yeah. yeah, we're so excited to announce that next Sunday, our Bethel Kids team will be hosting kids ministry inside our Life Center gym. And we will do this once in November. We'll do it once again in December. Everyone will continue to observe the county's guidelines, including wearing face masks right. and social distancing. But the Bethel Kids team can't wait to enjoy new games and crafts, along with more interactive service indoors. Please pre-register your child today at Bethel.org slash kids. Yeah. And uh, don't forget to mark your calendars again for the town hall webinar November 8th at 5 p.m. Go to Bethel.org slash town hall. It's important that you register. We hope to see you there. Bethel family, we have two wonderful opportunities to give back to others in Jesus' name. Yeah. First, the Campbell Unified School District has asked if we would host kids in our building for the purpose of enrichment, which means we will be able to host a Good News Club for kids for two hours in our building. We need many volunteers. Please go to Bethel.org slash events to sign up. Yeah, it's gonna be a great, great opportunity. Second, November 15th, it's our Mission Sunday and our Convoy of Hope food distribution. We need about 100 volunteers on Saturday the 14th to bag food for our guests on Sunday. For more information and to sign up, just go to Bethel.org slash events. Also, we receive our One Day to Feed the World offering on November 15th. So let's all give one day's wage, whatever, whatever you earn in a day, to help make a difference in the lives of desperate people every day. Now, as we take some time just to trans transition into our time of giving, uh, back to God, just want to thank you, Bethel family, for your incredible faithfulness and really extraordinary times. And uh, whether it's the Lord's tithe or whether it's your missions, offerings, or a heartbeat giving, you are making a difference in neighborhoods and nations. Now, there's three ways to give. Most of you know what that is. The first is online at Bethel.org slash give. The second way is through our Church Center app. And then the third is through text. You just text the amount you want to give or you'd like to give to the number 84321. You press send. It's just that simple. Now let's watch this video on the difference Convoy of Hope is making through their One Day to Feed the World program, followed by Pastor Ryan kicking off our new series, Reach. In Psalms 113.7, God says he lifts the poor from the dust and the needy from the garbage pile. That's what the scripture says. All that the children know here is garbage. Almost everyone in this community works in the trash dump, including the kids. It's like a time machine. They walk in and become adults. They get hurt a lot by knives, mirrors, and aluminum. Malnutrition and violence are the norm there and most kids have never gone to school before. Four years ago, I helped start this school right across from the Citadel. This is the front line of the battle. Until 2018, we didn't have any food at school. We started with zero. We even had a child passed out in class because she hadn't had anything to eat in more than 24 hours. It was very hard for us because kids were always hungry. I went looking for someone who could help, and I found Convoy of Hope. Now, we feed the kids every day. Because they have eaten, they are coming alive and learning more. For them to know that food is here, it gives them a sense of security that they lack in the rest of their life. Every child here is a treasure. 
Because of the food that Homeboy gives, combined with the education we're providing, the kids can keep dreaming. And if we just give them one chance, we can prove that they are valuable and that they could do something rather than just stay in poverty. God is doing something great here, and His promises are coming true. Hey, good morning. It's great uh, to be with you today. So good to have you with us today. Uh, we got an extra hour of sleep, so we should be good to go and ready to take it on. So we're going to get right into um, our, our teaching today. We are, uh, as you've heard, we're talking about reach, reach with conviction. That's what we're talking about today. And I'd like to begin our, our teaching this morning out of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 15. And uh, in, in this passage, Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says this. He says, all of this is for your benefit. First of all, we need to understand that the all of this that he talks about is before this scripture and after this scripture, he talks about hardships that he has endured. He's talked about times that he's gone through where it has been difficult, but he's done it all so that he could bring the message of God's grace to people. So he says, all of this is for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. God said, Paul says, I went through all that I've gone through so that more people can receive God's grace. And when more people receive God's grace, there's a rejoicing and there's a party. That's what I call rejoicing. There's a party and God will receive more and more glory. This church, this is our mission. This is what God's called us to. This is our purpose as followers of Jesus is to reach as many people as we can with the message of God's grace. We, we must not only embrace the message of God's grace, we must also look to reach out to others with this message as well. Um, to me, this is one of those things, God's grace, that's just too good to keep to myself. That as awesome as it is for me to experience God's grace, it's too good for me to keep it to myself. We'll talk about that more in just a little bit. But Paul models for us how to live out this message with conviction. And we're starting the series today called Reach. And as we talk about reach, today we're going to talk about reaching with conviction. Let me define for us this morning, let me define what we're talking about when we use the word conviction. Uh, conviction today means for us the deep belief that something is important enough to do something about it. It's a deep belief. It's something we believe, but it's not just what we believe. It's we believe it so much that we believe it's important that it should move us into action. It causes us to need to do something about it. It's important that we understand that, that, convenient, that, that conviction is not about convenience. That conviction is more than just something uh, that is important. Conviction is urgent. Conviction is non-negotiable. Conviction is both something I want to do and something I must do. Convictions are directly related to what I believe or maybe what I don't believe. Convictions don't go away with a good night's sleep. As a matter of fact, convictions will oftentimes keep us awake and keep us from sleeping. Jesus was known, um, Jesus was known to pray all night. And I believe it's because he believed something that was so true, it, it moved him to action. He could not rest because of the conviction of his heart. And that causes me to ask myself the question, what's keeping me up at night? Friend, what's, 
What's something that you believe so much that it's keeping you up? Maybe, maybe there's something that is breaking our hearts. That is where convictions are formed. Conviction is oftentimes personal. My conviction is not dependent upon other people's opinions. That if I have a conviction and someone else disagrees, if it's a true conviction, I press on. I, I don't really care about another person's opinions in regards to my convictions. Conviction starts with what I believe. There's a story that's told of David Hume. David Hume was an 18th century philosopher. Um, did not, uh, is not known for someone who, who embraced the historic Christianity. As a matter of fact, he rejected it. But the story goes that he saw a friend in the streets of London. And he asked his friend where his friend was going. And his friend said, hey, buddy, I am off to hear George Whitfield preach. And David said, but surely you don't believe what, Phil, what Whitfield preaches, do you? And his friend answers, no, I don't. But he sure does. I'll tell you, you can tell when someone believes what they're saying. And, and when someone believes what they're saying, you want to hear them, even if you have not yet embraced that belief. So conviction is discernible when we live what we say we believe. Now, when I have embraced God's grace for my own life, then I become a dispenser for that grace to others. What a beautiful, what a beautiful truth that is. That when I embrace God's grace for my life, I become a dispenser of that grace to others. I, I, don't, I don't think that we think of sharing our faith very often as becoming dispensers of God's grace. We are often dispensers of information. We want to tell people what we know and what they should believe. But I really think that when we really talk about what God's done for us, we should be dispensing the grace of God. In other words, I can only reach others with the message of God's grace when I've allowed God's grace to reach me. And this is super important for me today. I, I, if you have not yet received God's grace in your life, I, that's the number one priority of this teaching today is that you would understand and see how much God loves you. That you would understand the power of God's grace. And, and you don't need to feel any pressure to dispense God's grace until you first have received God's grace. You won't have any conviction about God's grace if you haven't received it. And so today, today we want to talk about the grace of God and becoming dispensers and what that lays out. How do we reach the lost, those who have yet to understand the grace of God? In Luke chapter 15, Jesus lays out for us um, the priority that he had in his life of reaching those who were lost. It's the story, actually Jesus will share three stories in Luke chapter 15, the story of the lost sheep, the story of the lost coin, and the story of the lost son. If, uh, if you're new to faith or you're examining the claims of Christ and you're not familiar with the Bible, Luke is one of the Gospels. And in, in these three stories, uh, the one you might recognize, the story of the lost son, we call that the, prodigal, the story of the prodigal son or the parable of the prodigal son. That's known and it's used in our, in our community and in common language. But that's where that comes from is in the, the book of Luke chapter 15. And Jesus tells these stories. And so it's important though, and, and, and in, in, our, in our teaching today, in our study, it's important to me that you understand the context in which Jesus tells these three stories. Because we, we don't often talk about who Jesus was talking to or who he said this to. We just talk about um, the stories. But the context really creates for us the meaning and the conviction that Jesus had about these stories. So if you would, Luke chapter 15, and I'm going to read for you verses 1 and 2, and here's the way it reads. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. It's the same way then as it is now. Tax collectors and sinners. Um, they, they were crooked. They were cheats. And most of us don't think that about the IRS. But, but, but they did in that day. And these folks weren't trusted. And Jesus was hanging out with a bad crowd. 
And they were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Verse 2. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. They muttered. They grumbled. They, they kind of complained. They didn't say it outright, but it was enough that they could be heard. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man, talking about Jesus, welcomes sinners and he eats with them. Now that's a funny phrase right there, and he eats with them. But what they said was, he just hangs out with them. That Jesus, Jesus just hangs out with the kind of people that we don't think he should hang out with. And, and, and this really bothered them. And I asked myself this question, why, why would this bother them? And I thought about it a little bit. Remember, they were the teachers of the law. Now I think maybe it bothered them because Jesus actually had people who wanted to hear what he had to say. And they didn't. I think maybe it bothered them because Jesus drew a crowd of people. And they couldn't. But let me tell you, Jesus drew a crowd of people who desperately needed and wanted to hear his message. As a matter of fact, it, it says that when Jesus spoke to them in another part of the Gospels, it says that they were amazed at his teaching for he spoke as one who had authority. That when Jesus spoke, people wanted to hear his message. Not just because he was eloquent or not just because he was a great order, but because when Jesus spoke, well, it, it made sense. That when Jesus spoke, um, it, it hit beyond their brain and it went to their heart. That there was something in them that said, this man, this man is speaking truth to us. I would, I would even suggest to you that that they wanted to hear Jesus, that they were drawn to Jesus because they, they could tell that Jesus was drawn to them. They could tell that Jesus actually cared about them. That in their sinful state, that in their state of imperfection, can you relate to that? Because I sure can. Because I know that I'm not perfect. And there's some times that when I am in the presence of God and I stop and I realize, man, I am not worthy. But I look up and I realize, man, he, he loves me. He loves me. And I want to be with Jesus because I know that he loves me. I would suggest to you that those people were drawn to Jesus because in the same way that I am here in the 21st century and I feel the love of Jesus even as much or more so they could tell that this guy who was quote a religious person loved them. And honestly they, they weren't used to that. Because here's the deal. The Pharisees the Pharisees were repulsed by those who believed differently than they did. They didn't like people. They treated them badly. They muttered about them and talked as if they were second class. And you know what? Jesus, Jesus actually sought those people out. I, I'm kind of like Jesus in some ways. I'd rather hang out with the sinners sometimes than hang out with the saints. Because the saints are just a little bit boring sometimes. Because the saints can't laugh at themselves. Because sometimes as the Christians and as the saints, we're trying to act like we're perfect when everyone knows that we're not. But all these tax collectors and sinners, they knew they were messed up. They knew they had problems. They knew they had issues. And they knew that Jesus loved them as they were. And friends... That's called grace. I learned a long time ago that Jesus loves me just the way I am. But he loves me too much to let me stay that way. That's the beauty of God's grace. So, I want to say this to you today if you're listening. And you're not yet a follower of Jesus. Maybe you're not quite sure if you believe all this Christianity stuff. I want you to know that Jesus welcomes you. That he wants to hang out with you. Because you're the kind of people he hung out with in the Bible. If you say, I don't know, Ryan, that if I don't know if I love God. Well, Jesus wants to hang out with you and show you how much God loves you. Because that's who Jesus was. And it was this Jesus that, 
that sought people out. As a matter of fact, Jesus said about himself in the next chapter, in Luke chapter 16, Jesus said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus said, I've come for those who need grace. And if you don't know that you need grace, you'll never receive it. If you don't know that you're lost, it'll be hard to know when you're found. So in this passage in Luke 15, these folks said, hey, uh, the, the sinners, the tax collectors are with Jesus. And then they, they looked and, and they mumbled and they said, who is this guy that he, he would do this, that he would hang out with these people? He even eats with them. And then, and then Jesus speaks and he begins to show us his conviction. Remember, the, the, the con that conviction is the deep belief that something is important enough to do something about it. The tax collectors believed that Jesus' conviction was that they were important. So, so Jesus has these people that are drawn to him. I, I was just thinking about this and, and I like to, oftentimes, as I read a passage of Scripture, I like to stop and ask myself some questions. Matter of fact, I don't know that I'm asking the questions as much as the Holy Spirit begins to prompt me and ask me questions. And some of the questions that I came across in this passage, some of the questions that I've been asking of myself are this. Are people that are different than me drawn to me? I, I, I ask myself the question, am I, am I like those religious leaders Am I muttering about others to other people? Maybe nowadays, am I muttering on social media? Am I saying things about people on social media that just puts them down? And, and do I really think this causes them to want to hear what I have to say about God's grace? One of the things that's really cool that I'm watching happen in this COVID-19 era is that we are working to build relationships and to help as many people at Bethel Church as we possibly can. And when I say at Bethel Church, I'm saying we are working to help our community. And we have sowed seeds and we've reached out and we let people know that, that we care and that we want to help them. And we, we're not saying that you have to be a part of our church to get help. We're not, we're not putting any kind of boundaries on people. We're just saying, hey, if you're a person and you need help, we, we want to help you. And the word is starting to spread and people are starting to figure that out. And you know, sometimes if we're not careful, uh, the church and the public schools, we can begin to act like we all um, are against each other. Because there's things that we believe differently than are taught in the public schools. And there's things that, that we can find to disagree with. But hey, the truth of the matter is, you and I can find things to disagree with. So we've just been reaching out. We've had a great partnership over the years with the Campbell School District. And we've got some folks in our church that go on a weekly basis and just help at the schools and just, just love on people there. And this, this last week, uh, they called us. And they said, hey, hey, during this COVID-19, can we just send kids to your school, to your church? We don't have a facility as big as yours. We need some place where they can social distance. And, and we, they just need some social interaction. Can we just send kids to you? And would you just, and you guys can teach them whatever you want. Well, we're going to talk to them about God's grace. We're going to let them know that God loves them. But what a cool thing that, that, that the world, that the people that aren't, don't necessarily agree with everything we say, that they're drawn to us and they're saying, hey, can we partner together? I love the fact that we've been able to give out um, 15 or 20 different hotspots to schools. There's kids that don't have internet access. And so we've bought hotspots that they can take home and they can use. And, and the schools just have come back to us now and said, hey, can you give us some more? And we're saying, absolutely. We care. We want to partner together with you. I mean, we've been asked by the schools. We went, to, we went to one middle school and said, hey, can we advertise our Convoy of Hope a bit? And they said, could you advertise it to all of our schools? Could you tell everybody that you're giving away food? We want everyone to come. This is what Jesus was like. You didn't have to agree with Jesus to be drawn to Jesus. Jesus would let you disagree with him, but Jesus would love you where you were, and he would move people into the grace of God. I, I am so thankful for people that are a part of our church that have done this well, that have reached out 
and have planted seeds and those seeds are becoming opportunities for us to help more people know about Jesus and to get their physical needs met. What a cool thing that is. So here is what Jesus said in response to the muttering of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. That they're, they're saying, what about, why is he hanging out with these folks? And then Jesus says to them these words. We'll find it in John chapter 15, uh, Luke chapter 15, verse 3. Then Jesus told them this parable. Now that them, I believe, is both the crowd that had gathered and the Pharisees and the te religious teachers of the law that were standing about muttering. Jesus was talking to two people at once. And perhaps today this message, this teaching will hit two, two people as well. Maybe you're someone that stands around and you're judging others and you're in your own self-righteousness thinking you're good enough. Jesus has a story that he wants to tell you about. But maybe today you're one of those people in the crowd that was a tax collector or a sinner. And that you don't, you, you, you're drawn to Jesus, but you don't know what he thinks. Well, today I want to share with you his conviction. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? I like that Jesus says, suppose one of you. Jesus makes this for them very personal. I don't know who he pointed to or if he even pointed, but he makes it a thing of saying, I want you to put yourself in this story. Insert yourself here. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep, one goes away, and when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and he goes home. I love this part. And then he calls all of his friends and neighbors together and he says, rejoice with me. Let me tell you what that means. Jesus said, he calls his friends and said, let's have a party. Let's do this. Celebrate good times. Come on. And he just gets excited. He just takes off. And Jesus says, when you find the one, you come with an amazing amount of rejoicing and celebration. Wow. Okay, so I get a little carried away with the party part, but, but you'll see that Jesus does too, so I'm in good company. But I want you to see this here. That Jesus says that when you have 100 and one goes away, you take care of the 99 and you go after the one. God is not content with most of us being found. God wants everyone found. This was a conviction of Jesus that he wanted every time one lost sheep is found. He said we're going to have a party because every sheep counts. Every person matters. I don't care how many you have. If you lose the one, no one, no one, Jesus said, should be left behind. It is Jesus' conviction that one lost sheep is way too many. The question is, is that our conviction? Is it ours? If I'm not careful, I can look at the people we have and ignore the people that we don't have. I can look at the people in the seats and ignore the empty seats. If I'm not careful, I can rejoice over the people who are safe rather than rejoicing over the lost sheep that I need to go and find. I think you're probably that way too. And it's good for us to stop and remember that the conviction of Jesus' heart, the conviction of his coming was to find the one lost sheep. And then Jesus turns in Luke chapter 15 and verse 8. Jesus turns and he says this story about a lost coin. He says, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. She has 10, she loses one. We had went from 100 to one, now it's 10 to one. Or suppose, doesn't she just light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? 
And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors, I like this part again, together, and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin in the same way, Jesus said. I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, Jesus is saying again, he says, hey, when you find that lost coin, there's a party. There's a rejoicing because once what was lost has now been found. Here's what I learned from this story is that God never cuts his losses. He searches for his investment all the way until it's found. And I learned this, that in God's eyes, everyone is valuable. Every sheep counts and every person Every coin was valuable. The one lost coin did not lose its value because of the other nine that the lady already had. That, that one coin still had value. And she said, does she not, Jesus said, does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? Jesus said, every, every person has great value. And when you value something that is lost, you turn on the lights, you clean up the mess, you search through. That's what Jesus says about you. He says that you count as a sheep. He says that you have value like a coin. And it doesn't matter how many people fill a church, the one that is lost does, still has great value in the eyes of God. That's God's conviction. Jesus is telling those Pharisees, this is why I'm hanging out with the tax collectors and sinners. Because they count. Because they matter. Because they have value. Jesus did not call us to be the lights of the world, and he did call us to be the lights of the world, but he didn't call us to be the lights of the world in order to expose the darkness. He called us to be the lights of the world to expel the darkness so that we can search for and rescue those who are being held captive in the darkness. I think sometimes we think we're the light so we can, we can show up and make people look bad because we can talk about how good we are. That's what the Pharisees did. That's, that's what the religious teachers of Jesus' day did. They compared their righteousness to the sinners and they thought that they were exposing the sinners. And Jesus says, you missed it. That's not what the light's for. The light is to help us find that which was lost. The light expels the darkness it does not expose it. It was Jesus' conviction that his message was to bring light into darkness in order to bring hope to the lost. Oh, you got to hear that. It was Jesus' conviction that his message was to bring light into the darkness in order to bring hope to the lost rather than condemnation. Is it ours? We call ourselves followers of Jesus. Are these our convictions because they were his? It's what he thought. It's how he navigated the world. It's how he lived. And he was willing to take criticism for it. He was willing to stand for this conviction. Do we believe that? All of this so far has been about sheep and coins. But Jesus brings it home in this last story. In this last story, it's all about us. It's about people. It's about a person. It's about, it's about a lost son. And it uh, starts in verse 11, but I, I was thinking and I thought about this because I have been a lost son. I was one time lost and then I was found. Obviously, I was found because here I am. 
But I was lost when I was about seven years old. I might have been a little bit younger, but um, I was lost. And it was at a store called Mervyn's. And if you're, um, if you're in the younger generation, you have no idea what Mervyn's was. But I'll just tell you that Mervyn's was the predecessor of Target. It was Target, but not quite as good as Target. But it had a lot of different departments, and you could get a lot of different stuff at Mervyn's. And it was one of those things. Matter of fact, you know that I was young because I was at Mervyn's. And so we're at Mervyn's, and I found myself one time at about stage of seven, I found myself lost. I mean, I looked around and I could not find my mother. I was petrified. I was scared. You know what that feels like? You know that feeling when you're lost as a kid? And well, the world just feels so big and so huge and you're there and you don't know where you're at in it. And I imagine that my mom too felt that sense of horror because she probably looked around and, and, and she couldn't find me. I've had that feeling with my kids and even with my grandkids that I just turn away for a second and when I come back, they're gone and I don't know where they went. And I, almost a panic comes over you and you begin to look. And I want you to think about those feelings. I want you to remember what it's like to be lost. I want you to remember what it's like not only to be lost as a child, but what it's like as a parent to lose your child. Those are, those are deep emotions. And I'd also like you to remember if you're a follower of Jesus, I'd like you to remember what it was like when you were a lost sheep or a lost coin. I want you to remember what it was like to be lost. It's good for us to remember what it was like before we found Jesus, what our life was like before Jesus, because that gives us compassion for those folks that are still in that state. So remember that as we go into this story, but I'll give you the end of this story. I was at Mervyn's and I was lost and I don't remember uh, if I was crying uh, and the lady came up to me or if I was just sharp enough, because I'm a pretty sharp guy here, uh, sharp enough to know that, hey, that tag that said Mervyn's with the lady's name on it meant she was safe. So I just went over and I just said, I, I, I lost my, my mom. And she said, okay, little boy. She said, what's your name? I said, well, I'm Ryan. And she said, oh, okay, little Ryan. She says, what's your mom's name? And I said, well, my mom's name is mom. That's why I call her that. She's called mom. You just called her my mom. So you know my mom's name. So she kind of, you know, I kind of looked at me perplexed, which is not unusual for people to do that. And as she looked at me perplexed, she says, what do other people call your mom? And I thought about it. And I grew up in church. So we were a uh, back in the day, this is back in the 70s, and if you remember, if you're around the church in the 70s, you'll remember that uh, we just didn't call each other by our first names then. Uh, there was, uh, when you got to a certain age, we didn't even say Mr. and Mrs. We called everybody brother and sister. And so I thought through myself, well, what, what, do every, what does everyone call my mom? And I realized, oh, they call her Sister Wright. So I just said to her, I said, they call my mom Sister Wright. And she looked at me perplexed, like Sister Wright. And so she got on the loud system and she said over the Mervyn's intercom, Sister Wright, would you come to check stand three? We have your son here. And I think it, she was waiting for my mom. She was waiting for a nun to show up because Sister Wright, she just thought it would be a Catholic nun. And my mom is a beautiful lady. And so when she showed up and was looking all fashionable, I'm sure this lady was quite perplexed that Sister Wright came to get her son. It probably started a scandal, or at least a gossip scandal, all throughout Modesto when that happened. But that's how I was found. Meanwhile, back to Jesus' story. So Jesus... Jesus tells us about a lost son. And this story is about a son who was lost, not because he didn't know where he was, but because he lost his internal compass. Can you relate to that? He was lost. He lost sight of what really mattered in his life. He thought that he saw a better way. Jesus, Jesus spends more time on this story than he does on the other two. I think because it's more relatable, because so many of us, 
We're not geographically lost, but we're lost in our heart. And so Jesus tells a story about this young man who insults his father by saying, hey, I want my inheritance. I want my share of my inheritance. Basically, he said, Dad, I, I, I would rather have my, I, I want to pretend like you're dead so I can have your money. And then, and this is the story that Jesus tells. He says the father gives him the money. And then he takes off and, and he abandons the family values and he goes out and he, he, he goes out and he parties and he is, gets with prostitutes and he sw- takes all the money and he just goes right through it and he blows it all. And he pondered and squandered all of his wealth. And then a famine hit the land and all of a sudden he couldn't make any money. He, he was just stuck. In the lowest moment of his life, he found himself feeding pigs, which is low for anybody, but is especially low for a Jewish man. And in humiliation, he realizes that his father's servants are better off than he is. And in his humiliation, he stands and he begins the long journey home and he returns to his father full of shame. It's an interesting thing that he trusted his father's love enough to go back, even if it meant he would be treated as a servant. And to his absolute surprise, he was welcomed and overwhelmed by the extravagant love of his father. The very father he had insulted, whose values he had abandoned, the one whose wealth he had lost, was now running to him and hugging him and kissing him, even as he reeked and smelled a pig. The scripture, and the way Jesus says it in verse 20, is beautiful. It says, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. And he was filled with compassion. It means he loved him greatly. And he ran to his son. And he threw his arms around him. And he kissed him. And of course, in Jesus' story, he threw a party. He said, kill the fattened calf. Go ahead and get everybody around. We're having a party. My son is home. Maybe you feel more like the sun in this story. Maybe you feel like you're wallowing and you've hit bottom and there's no place to go. Jesus is telling us here that the Father says you can come home. You can come home. There's a place for you. You can come home. And then Jesus ties this all together and he puts the Pharisees this time in this story. He puts them in the place of the older brother who was ticked off. He didn't care that his brother was home. He was upset because he didn't get a party. He was upset because while he had worked hard, there was no celebration for him. And in the last verse, last two verses of this chapter, Jesus pulled, the the father pulls the son aside and in Jesus' story, the father says this. He says, my son... The father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and we had to be glad because this brother of yours was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and he is now found. And Jesus shares with us his conviction. And it is Jesus' conviction that there is no place you can go that is too far away for you to come home if you want to. There is no place you can't go that is too far away for you to come home if you want to. Is that yours? If you're far away from God, if you've walked away and you've wallowed in a mess and you've just messed it all up and you think, I can't go back, Jesus tells you, yes, you can. I'm watching for you. And if you'll take the step towards me, I'll run and I'll meet you and I'll embrace you. That's his conviction that it's never too late 
and you're never too far away that you can't come home. And I think there's another part of this that we need to see, that this son, these Pharisees, and I read this passage, I ask myself, are there people in my world that I've given up on? And that I think maybe they're a lost cause. Let's ask ourselves that question. Not, don't do it quickly so we can ignore it. But go through, go through your list of names of people in your life. Who do you think maybe is a lost cause and is, they're too far gone? Jesus says they're not. Maybe it's the homeless guy we walk by on the street and we think, well, he's lost. He's a lost cause. No, he's not. He's a coin that has great value. He's a sheep that someone needs to go after. We, we can't go too far. We can't go so far away that we're not welcome and we can't return to the Father. So, if we're not careful, we, we think people are too far gone, so we choose to hate them rather than love them. It might be somebody, nowadays, it might be somebody from a different political party that you think they're just too far gone. Either way. And instead of being loving towards them, like Jesus would call you to, instead of searching for them and being a dispenser of God's grace to them, you speak harshly about them. And you speak harshly. And I just need you to know that if you put your, if you're doing that and you put yourself in Luke 15, you don't put yourself in the place of Jesus. You put yourself in the place of the Pharisees and the religious leaders. Because they didn't like these guys because they were different. They believe something different than I do. That's not the way Jesus operated in this world. And let me just, let me just remind you of this, that in every story here, that whenever a lost sheep or a lost coin or a lost son was found, Jesus said, let's throw a party. He celebrates the lost being found. This church, the gathering of the church together, we, this thing that we call church is meant to be a party celebrating the lost being found. We want to embrace and celebrate and put into action the convictions of Jesus. And that's this, that, that no one should be left behind. We should reach out for everyone. That everyone is valuable and we should be reaching for them. That no one is so far gone that they are beyond God's reach. And if God is reaching for them, he wants to use us to reach them as well. Are those our convictions? I'm not asking if we believe it. I'm asking do we live it? I'm asking, is that something that we are endeavoring to do? Jesus told us in Matthew 28, 19, go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, reach, reach to the whole world. And as followers of Jesus, we must embrace the grace that Jesus offers us and the convictions that is meant for us to share them with others. So what do we do with this? Three things. I'd encourage you today to pray. Ask the Holy Spirit to make Jesus' convictions our convictions. Lord, help me love what Jesus loved. Help me think like Jesus thinks. Lord, show me where I'm not living these out in my life. Ask God to give us His love for the people we don't like. Try that one on. And then number three, look for ways to give God's grace to people every chance we get. Love them wherever we're at. Love everyone because everyone matters. Everyone's valuable because no one is so far away from God that they don't count and they can't come back. As a matter of fact, Jesus tells us we um, are therefore Christ's ambassadors. 
as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. We are commissioned by God to represent Jesus in this world. And this Jesus of Luke chapter 15, I believe, is being underrepresented in the world in which we live. And church, let us embrace that. Let us become the hands of Jesus. Let us become the heart of Jesus, that it's embracing people in our world. If today, if today you're here and you're listening to me and you've yet to receive the grace of God, here's, here's what it is in a nutshell. The truth of the matter is, the good news is, is that we're all sinners. Well, that's the bad news. We're all sinners. And that we desperately need a Savior. And the reality of it is, we can't save ourselves. We need a power that's greater than ourselves to restore sanity to our lives. And Jesus said, I will go for God so loved the world that he sent his son, he gave his son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's the good news. Jesus came to be our savior, to take the punishment for our sins. And he simply said, if you will surrender your life to me, if you will come, I will do a great exchange. I will give my life for yours. And I will give you eternal life. And if you follow me, I'll lead you through this life into the next. Wow, that's a powerful message. That is the good news of God's grace. In John 3.16, I just quoted to you, but John 3.17 to me is even more powerful. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save it. Jesus came on a search and rescue mission. We were the lost who he is looking to find. If you want today, just simply say a prayer that says, Jesus, I want to give you my life. I surrender myself to you. I am lost. And today, I want to reach out because I know that you're reaching out to me. And I want to be a part of your forever family. And Jesus, today I just come and I surrender to you and I make you the leader of my life. And I today, from this day on, will follow you to the best of my ability as you help me in this life. Man, if you prayed that prayer today, we, we are so excited. As a matter of fact, we would like to know that you prayed that prayer so that we can follow Luke 15 and we can have a party. We would love to celebrate that you have decided to follow Jesus, that you are one that was away and now you came back. We've all done that and we would love to help you on your journey along the way. If you would just send us an email, an email at hello at Bethel.org, we would love to celebrate that with you. And uh, just let us know, say, hey, today I gave my life to Jesus. Today I let Jesus become my leader. If you, if you did that today, I would love to know it. We would love to have you do that for us. Hello at Bethel.org. That would be fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for um, being a part of Bethel Church Online. We love you and uh, we, we celebrate you today. And I, I just pray you have a great day. God bless. Have a wonderful week. Don't forget to vote. God bless. Hey, if you just prayed that prayer or you're new to Bethel Church, would you please let us know? Just send an email at hello at Bethel.org. Hello at Bethel.org. Also, join us in our Zoom lobby by clicking the link in the chat. We would love to meet you. We'd love to help get you connected at Bethel Church. We know that now more than ever, people are searching for community and connection. Yeah. So we encourage joining a life group. Here at Bethel, we have many life groups. Visit Bethel.org slash life groups to discover groups for women, men, young adults, support groups, and more. Yeah, and again, we just uh, want to remind you that the town hall webinar is November 8th at 5 p.m. It's important that you go to Bethel.org slash town hall to register. Uh, thanks again for joining with us. We so appreciate that. We hope to see you again next week for part two of the series entitled Reach. God bless and have a great week.